This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. Anyway, my name uh, is Gregory Cornelius, um, and I work at Automat, which is uh, the company that makes the Windows Phone and Windows Mobile Phone and Windows Desktop Applications. Uh, so, what I'm here to chat a bit about tonight is uh, JavaScript, and uh, uh, before kind of getting into some sort of fundamental fundamentals of JavaScript, kind of advanced fundamentals of JavaScript, I wanted to just talk a bit about some strategies for thinking and learning um, that have been really helpful for me to become who I am as a developer. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I started out as, uh, uh, well, and then after that, then get into the, these, these fundamentals that I think uh, are important to, you know, the strength of your foundation uh, really uh, influences how strong your building is. You know, so the, the, the stronger you have a, a, an understanding of those fundamentals, the better uh, developer you can be. Um, so kind of briefly about my background. So I... Uh, got into programming through music. Uh, so I studied saxophone and composition and then uh, did a lot of electronic music and kind of through electronic music got into programming. And then moved to Boston, I don't know, about six or seven years ago and, and took a job at Boston University across the river and got into doing web development. I had already had some experience, but it was all kind of like my personal projects and for friends and stuff, so I got into WordPress originally to build a site for a friend of mine because she wanted uh, a website because I had one. She's a saxophonist in New York, and uh, so I built her a site. And I that I had done this for a few friends, and I, I was like, I need something that you know I don't have to edit the site. So I was like, oh, I looked around. Hey, oh, WordPress. I think I can use this. So I made a simple theme. And anyway, um, fast forward a few years and. I got started working at Boston University and then got really deep into it. And how I got to where I am today at Automatic is by essentially being obsessively compulsive about going deeper uh, to the point where, yes, and that, that's how I ended up uh, in where I am now. And I, in 3.9, I contributed to WordPress core, was involved in writing some of the media features and uh, the uh, called WP Views in the editor, the ability to see the gallery inside the editor. And in WordPress 4.0, you'll be able to see your embeds in line in the gallery, in the editor. Um, so some neat stuff. Anyway, so uh, the, the most important thing is that you, you do something. So assuming that you've done something and, you, and you've written some code, um, here's some questions that, that I think are important to ask yourself to kind of keep yourself in check. So uh, do I know how the code really works? So when I was working with designers, uh, they would copy and paste jQuery from the web. And they very rarely, you know, it did something. It, it made something that moved on the screen or whatever. Um, but they couldn't understand necessarily how, how it worked. Not to say that they couldn't now if they spent time learning it, but that wasn't their interest. They were interested in just getting something moving on the screen. As a developer, it was important to me to understand really what that code did. So uh, I encourage you to do that. Uh, when you're working on code, you know, the first time, you know, get it working, but then can I, can I make it better? Can I write it more simply? Where is the complexity? How do I get rid of that complexity? Uh, can I make it simpler by making better use of the libraries that I'm using? So I'm using jQuery. Do I know jQuery's API? Can I uh, use a, an API that makes my code simpler? Um, are there multiple places? This is kind of classic do not repeat yourself where I'm using the same idiom. Can I write something that will keep me from having to repeat myself? Are there edge cases that I might be missing? So constantly thinking about, well, what are the ranges of possible input and output, and how can I account for them? Um, am I guessing? So this kind of is leading to the next question. So. It's a perfectly valid strategy in a way, but it's very, it takes a lot longer 
if you just are guessing. So you're saying, well, you know, I think if I try this, maybe it will work. Oh, if I try this, maybe it will work. And you do that for an hour, two hours, five hours, and you might get close to the solution, and you might have learned some things along the way, but if you then flip it on its head and say, instead of just trying to guess to get a particular, particular output and say, okay, well, what, what do I need to know fundamentally to be able to produce what it is that I want to come out? Um, so maybe that means reading some things. So while it's great to spend time trying to get something working, sometimes it's more important to take a step back and say, you know, I need to make some time to learn. <laughs> Uh, learn some, learn some things, um, and and experiment as you're learning. You know, whatever strategy works best for you to, to internalize. Uh, so, while the web is a great wealth of information it's all over the place, I found actually that books are a much faster way to get to the the, the source of truth. Uh, people that write books, you know, especially if they're published. They're, they're more likely to be an expert on the subject area. Uh, if you do a Google search, you might get someone that knows the right answer, but they might not. And you, that takes time to wade through uh, all of the answers to find the correct one. Uh, Stack Overflow, though, I mean, with its ranking system, that does help. But still, uh, I think that if you really want to build a, a firm foundation, books are great. Uh, now, if you're a little crazy, you can uh, read documentation and specs. So this is like going down a level, right? So an expert will write a book about something either, you know, they, uh, Rasmus, who uh, was one of the creators of PHP, he might, I don't think he actually wrote a book on PHP that I've read at least. Anyway, he might have wrote a, wrote a book, but, um, you know, you could read documentation that's produced by the PHP folks. Uh, all the WordPress documentation uh, it keeps getting better. Um, that, that effort in 3.9 was amazing, how all the inline documentation in the code. Um, and you can read specs. Here are just a few kind of sources. Uh, Mozilla's developers network. So it turns out that these browser vendors write pretty good documentation in some cases, uh, including Internet Explorer. I actually, especially when you need to deal with Internet Explorer, it helps to read their documentation. Uh, the W3C, right, so the standards body behind many of the web technologies we use. Uh, the Safari documentation, especially good for mobile stuff. Safari is the new IE, uh, mobile Safari that is, so uh, it's a huge pain. I don't know if, how many of you guys agree, but dealing with, with issues in iOS is just the bane of my existence. It's also hard to test. But, um, and then there's IETF, which is for the sort of low-level protocols and whatnot for the web. That's a good place to read specs. Um, and then, so you know, we're getting a little deeper. We can get way down and read the source code. So I spent a lot of time reading WordPress source code. I learned a lot from reading WordPress source code. I, now I read a lot of JavaScript, uh, whether it's jQuery or Backbone some of the other libraries that I'm using now, uh, a library called React. Um, there's so much to be learned from the source code. It's like the source of truth. I mean, you can, with JavaScript, you can, you know, it's hard for, for uh, companies to hide their code because it has to run in your, your browser. So it might be really obfuscated through minification and whatnot, but you can actually figure out some things about what they're doing at a, at least a high level. Uh, and then as you're doing all this, it's really important to experiment and to play and have fun. Build little prototypes, like little one-off things. Like It doesn't have to be like a product that you, that you really just play around, and that all kind of builds up into a sort of body of understanding. Uh, of course, uh, uh, one of the things that I've done that has been really enjoyable and is addictive is to contribute to WordPress core. Uh, and this can happen in a lot of different ways. So I'm talking about this from the standpoint of a developer who uh, right now is really heavily involved in, in the JavaScript side. But this could be uh, someone that's interested in other aspects of 
usability, uh, design, um, just how, uh, even support, all those sort of things. You can become better at any of those skills by contributing to the WordPress project. Um, so anyway, so how many of you guys write JavaScript on a daily basis? Okay. <laughs> And that, so, <laughs> I worry a bit that this talk might be a little bit too technical. Um, so, maybe before, I, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Thanks for uh, asking. Um, yeah, so, what I, what I have prepared is uh, sort of assuming that, that you write, that you've written some JavaScript and that um, it's something that you do somewhat regularly, and you, um, at least in the other context of WordPress, and, and might be interested in, in digging deeper. So we'll see. You know, please ask questions because um, I want to make sure that folks are getting something out of this. So, uh, for folks that are familiar with PHP, JavaScript is, has a lot of similarities, but it has one pretty major difference, at least in terms of how PHP was written historically. Since PHP 5.3, uh, there's a bit more flexibility in terms of how functions are used, but um, historically, uh, it was something that you would declare the function in the, in the PHP file, and it, it, it uh, it wasn't something that you could change on the fly. So while the code was executed, you couldn't say, okay, I want this function to, to uh, have this body. So uh, this is just an illustration of that. So there's a few different ways that you can declare or define a function in JavaScript. So one is a name function, this function at the top. Uh, so it, it's a function with a, a name. So uh, I call that by calling make money. So down here I have the statement make money where I'm passing the five and that's going to output to the log here uh, five dollar signs. So it's doing a small loop and adding uh, dollar signs to the string. Um, this is the same, this function does the same thing, but it's a function expression. So we have a variable where we're assigning an anonymous function to that variable. Um, I could also name that function, so it could actually say make money to function make money. Uh, it would be kind of weird in that case because I would be defining this function again. Um, and then uh, this variable, it refers to a function. Well, in both cases, you, these functions are available in that scope. So make money is actually Available and I can assign make money free uh, to that that function object. Uh, so within JavaScript, everything's an object. So functions are actually objects. Um, anyway, just to keep me honest, um, I clicked run here, and we can see that the output of those four log statements is the same. Um, so functions can be defined at any so you can have functions defined within functions, within functions, within functions. So you can have this nesting of functions. Um, and one of the interesting things that that opens the door to is this notion of closure. So a closure is a situation where you have this function that's inside the scope of another function. And when it refers to a variable from that outer scope, uh, that, that variable exists beyond the, the execution of this function. So what that means is um, that, and, and I can't access it from the outside. So I can't say a console log uh, of money and get any value out because it will be undefined. It's only defined within the scope of this make money machine. Um, and I can also return functions and assign them to something. So what this is doing, is I'm executing this make money machine function and assigning it the return value uh, to make money, which in this case is this name function, make some. So it's returning a function. So this now refers to 
a function that was output here, but it also uh, has this this uh, bar money scope. So anytime that I call make money here, I'm adding to this variable that, that, that persists for as long as um, right. So. So in this case, I have an output of 5, which is the length of this string. And then I have an output of 20, because uh, bar money sticks, sticks around. And then I have an output of an error, because I added a little error condition. So in this case, it, yeah, it's throwing an error. Um, and I just kind of slipped in. That's actually throwing it in the, in the form of an exception. So. That's why Chrome is, is uh, being very loud about that. Um, another kind of interesting capability is that I can invoke uh, a function expression immediately. Uh, so in this case, um, I have this function, and then I'm immediately invoking it. So this is something that you'll see often when you want to create um, an, a sort of a module where nothing from the outside should have any interactions, should be able to get at and interact with this. So this is just my my private playground. So an example of where I might want to use this would be in a plugin where I wanted to make sure protect that plugin, the JavaScript for that plugin, I guess any other plugin, make sure that um, so in this case there's there, there's no Anything I, I do inside of here is not in the global scope, at least the way that it's written here. And so I don't have to worry that someone else is going to come along and, and define their own make money function and have them overlap. Um, that's much nicer than in PHP, where the recommendation is to have like some class that provides a namespace or prefix each function. Um, so this provides a, a avenue for encapsulation of that functionality and avoiding that problem. So when I click run in this case, we still have our closure. Uh, so we're calling uh, make money a couple times and, and uh, so we have 10 and then, uh, and then 30. And then down here, when we try to call it again, we get an error. Um, any questions about is this helpful? <laughs> okay. Um, so, as I was saying, you know, really the two big things, well, there's kind of three different types of objects that I think are really critical to understanding JavaScript. One is uh, the array, which um, I'm not really talking about here. Uh, another is the function, which just went over. And then the other big one is the object. Um, so this is an example of a very simple object literal. So I just have an object with two properties, money and then make money. The second property points to a function. Uh, and so this operates in a way that is somewhat similar to the closure in that uh, money uh, persists. But um, instead of referring to it just as a variable, I prefix it with this. And this refers back to the object. So it's saying this dot money, so this object, and then locating money and adding a dollar sign, having a dollar sign, and then returning it when it's finished with that loop. So this does uh, same sort of, uh, has the same sort of result as the um, closure, where I'm starting with 20, or well, starting with string of length zero, and then adding $20 signs, so I end up with a string of length 20, and then add another 100, and I end up with uh, 120 as the length here. Um, and I call it, you know, I have my object, and then I can point to a property of that object by using the dot to access it. So magic bank dot more one. Um, and I'm calling that, and then as a shortcut uh, using another dot. So this is returning a string which has the property of line. So 
I'm taking advantage of that. <clears throat> so we can combine functions and objects and this the notion of a closure to create a module. And what this module does is it creates sort of a private space where I have all this logic and then I expose an interface to the outside world. So in this case I have my variable money from the closure that I had before. I have a function more money, which is adding dollar signs to the string, setting the line. Uh, then I added a donate function, which what I was thinking when I was writing this, but uh, that calls more money, this function up here, to add the dollar signs, and then uh, returns the string saying thanks for your donation, I guess. Um, and then that gets exposed by returning an object where the two properties, so I have a more money property and a donate property, and those point to those functions that I have to find. So when I call this make magic bank function, what I get back is an object with those two properties. Um, and so then when I scroll down here. Uh, so then when I <coughs> when I call these three log statements, what what do I get? Yeah. Um, if you added a bar in the magic bank two Sorry. Uh, so uh, this pattern is something that's used in WordPress. Uh, actually, this uses a few different of those examples, um, kind of all wrapped up into a single chunk of code. Uh, this is from the Heartbeat API. The Heartbeat API is what's used in WP Admin to periodically check to see if you're around um, and log in. So if for some reason your uh, WordPress session were to uh, expire uh, so that you were logged out, instead of having to like do some operation and have your data be lost or something, this would detect that case and, and put up the, the login screen inside the admin. Um, so uh, anyway, so this has um, the immediately invoked function expression. So we have this function that wraps scroll down just to show. Um, and it's passing in actually a couple of parameters. Um, it also has this interesting trick where it passes in a parameter at the top that isn't passed in at the bottom. Um, so we end up with an argument that is undefined, so we can use that to test whether our variable is undefined. Um, then we have this heartbeat function which returns an interface, so a set of, an object with a set of properties that are intended for use on the outside world. Um, and this just 
there's a lot more code here than what, I, what I'm showing, but um, this is just some functions that then are assigned to those properties here. Anyway, it's a pretty good way to uh, structure JavaScript in a way that uh, you have some private logic and some public. Um, so, how, so one of the things about uh, JavaScript that's confusing, and I, I think it took me a little while to understand this, is that um, you can call a function in a particular way, so prefixing a function with new and then calling the function, and uh, when you do that, uh, it returns not the output of this function, so I could have some return false here, but instead it returns a new object. Um, so it's, when we call a function this way, we say that uh, we're, return, we're calling it via its constructor. So it's constructing, using the function to construct a new object, um, and typically the function body ends up looking a bit different then you uh, want to call a function as a constructor in this fashion. And so in this case, we see the this keyword showing up. And uh, when prefix is new, this is referring to the instance of the new object. So we're creating an object that has this, that has a property of money and a property of more money. So this is basically the same as that object literal but it's created via a function, so I can create multiple instances of that object. And each instance is independent of one another. So that would mean that each time I, I call the constructor, uh, my property money starts with no dollar sign, so it starts over. So it's like I have multiple branches of my bank. Each instance is a separate branch of the bank. <coughs> um, I can actually still call magic bank without the new keyword. Uh, if you don't, if you're not operating in a strict mode, um, it will actually let you do that. It's just that this refers to a window in the browser. So I end up with money and more money being closed. It's kind of that. Uh, anyway. So this will output 25 and then 50 dollar signs. So um, yeah. So we can take this then, now that we have this notion that an, uh, a function can function as a constructor, so I have this function here that I've set up to be a constructor. Um, and the only way that, there's a kind of a convention that uh, most people follow where a constructor will start with a capital letter. Uh, it doesn't have to, but it makes it a lot easier to figure out what's going on uh, when you're looking through a lot of code. Um, so every object has a prototype, and that prototype is what is used when uh, is available. So when you create, when you call a new magic thing, uh, it's doing a few different things. Um, it's calling this function, but it's also referring to the prototype to figure out what that object looks like. So you have this, uh, so the prototype is another object, but it's linked to uh, the instance here. So this magic bank would ha has a prototype, and that prototype is uh, this prototype here, which um, I've added a property. So it's, it's an object with one property more than one. This gets kind of confusing, um, <laughs> but it's a very, it's how inheritance works in JavaScript. Um, and there's a lot of libraries that make it easier. I mean, uh, jQuery has a way to make, to make this simpler. Uh, there's a method called extend uh, that allows you to extend objects. Uh, Backbone has a similar kind of method. Um, so, Yes, yeah, so we have what we had before with this uh, constructor and then a prototype with a more money property. It's a little different in that before more money wasn't hanging off the prototype, it was hanging off the actual object that was created. 
Um, so what happens when I call more money here is behind the scenes it goes and looks at the object magic bank and says, hey, is there a more money property? If so, call that. If not, let's go look at the prototype. Goes back up to the prototype chain, looks at the prototype, hey, is there a more money function? Uh, calls that function. If not, it goes up the chain uh, until it reaches the, the uh, final prototype in the, in the, the chain, which uh, would be the objects. Um, so in this case, uh, there's two layers. There's the Magic Bank's prototype, and then the prototype of Magic Bank is the object. Um, so we can then take, so once we have that prototype, we can create another object using that pro uh, create another object and have it share the same prototype as magic bank. So that's what this is doing now. Here I have another constructor function. Um, but I'm uh, specifically setting its prototype to a new object, so a clone of the magic bank prototype. Um, and then setting the constructor to auto bank. Uh, so what that means is that uh, when I jump to this next screen here. Um, so this is what it what that chain looks like. Uh, we have our auto bank instance which has a proto property that points to this prototype which has a constructor with this function, and then the prototype points to the magic bank prototype, which has the magic bank constructor and this more money function, which is an important one uh, for what we're doing. And then um, when I, so I just jump back here. So when I create a new auto bank and call bank.moreMoney, it's going to Call. So creating a new auto bank sets this dot money to five dollar signs in this string, and calling more money will point uh, calls this function up here because of this uh, prototype chain that's been set up. <coughs> anyway, so that uh, outputs the twenty five dollar signs, and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is 30, sorry. Uh, the first time it outputs 25, and then the second time because of this uh, constructor that I've uh, set. Yeah, thank you for catching that. Okay. So we can actually take this a step further and create a function where when called as a function, uh, we will call that same function with the new keyword and return object. Uh, so what this actually, how this works, is when I call magic bank down here, it, it comes through the function the first time and says, is this an instance of magic bank? If not, return new magic bank. So when it comes through the first time, it isn't an instance, this doesn't refer to, uh, isn't an instance of magic bank. So it, it previously was new, calls the function again as a constructor, it falls through and then sets this up money to uh, end this um, So this is actually uh, a slightly simplified <laughs> example of what jQuery actually does. So when you call jQuery, you pass in some parameters, it returns an instance of the jQuery object. Um, it does it sort of like this. So anyways, the rest works as might expect. <clears throat> Any questions or thoughts? Yeah. You are 
giving of property to the Magic Bank prototype. Apparently, before Magic Bank exists, or is that not? Uh, well, it exists in that the variable is defined up here. So I have a function object up here that I've been um, adding the properties to the prototype. Mm -hmm. Is that? No. Yeah. Um, so this example here is a way to uh, essentially use a function to mix in um, an operation. Uh, into an, uh, an object. So I have this function, con this constructor list up here. So I could give away the a. So in addition to being capitalized, one giveaway for a function that's a constructor is that it will have it will refer to this inside of its body um, and not be a part of an object. Um, so I have this this function list that accepts a DOM node, a template, and an array of items. Um, and it just is storing them as properties of the object that's, that's returned. Uh, and then I have this render function, which starts with a string of a, an, open, uh, an ordered list. It iterates across the items and calls the template function on each item and adds to this string until I have a, a snippet of HTML. And then by referring back to this element, this down element, it sets HTML of that element. Uh, and then at that point, we actually have something in the browser that's ordered this. So that's this constructor and its single render method. And then down here, um, I have a, a function that accepts a, product, a prototype and a property name. And it adds another property to the prototype. So this is adding a sort function. In this case, it's a very sort of simple implementation. There's not, uh, it's just using the internal sort uh, that's available on arrays. So what, it, what this is basically, what this is doing is it allows me to pass in a object, uh, a function object, passing its prototype, and then add a sort function to it. So then any, so any function, any constructor that I have, I can pass it into this sort, and it would add, mix in a sort functionality uh, on a particular property. Um, this gets to be a. This is a very powerful. Um, a bit of functionality. This is an example of how, how it might work. So here I have a very simple little template function that creates a list item. So it's taking in the item and preventing and appending uh, li. Then I have my calling my constructor where I'm passing in a DOM element, the template function, so this proves there and then an array of items. And uh, actually, I need to show how that mix-in actually looks. So this is how I'm mixing in the list.prototype, passing the list.prototype to the sort mix-in, which is then adding a sort method uh, for the property items. So when I then in the next slide here, when I call list.sort, it's actually sorting the list and rendering it. So when I run this, um, we'll see that I have an ordered list that is being added with on um, that's in alphabetical order. Um, so it's sorted by array. And then um, so what actually this, I mean, aside from the sort of mix-in piece, 
what we actually have here is something very similar to kind of the, the kind of foundation of what backbone is. So backbone basically is you have uh, some sort of data and you have uh, which we call models or collections and then we have a view. The view gets the model and collection gets pushed into the view and then you call render and it, and it renders that into the DOM. So that's the foundation of a lot of the media code and WP admin is, is back. Uh, so one of the kind of goals with this was to sort of start from the foundation and lead towards uh, backbone. Um, so backbone has its own extend method, which uh, makes it possible to take the prototype of a backbone model and create a new constructor. Um, so this there's a lot of functionality, properties, and whatnot that are associated with a backbone model that I'm not really touching on here. But um, nonetheless, I can create a bank that is an extension of this backbone model. Um, backbone has this notion of the defaults, which are the default attributes for that model. So I have set up my money for the empty string as a um, default. And then this make money function which is getting the money attribute, iterating across, adding the dollar signs, and then setting the attribute back um, and returning. Um, so it does the same thing as all the other things, um, just using backbone. Um, I get $20 signs. Um, and then this is the, what I was talking about with the view. So I have that same model. and. Um, a very simple little uh, render method in the backbone view, which gets whatever the current value of money is and sets uh, the element that the backbone view is, is, is bound to, uh, sets the text to a number of dollar things. Um, so. And then there's a little bit more where I'm actually constructing the view. So I have my, have my new model, and then I have my view, and I mash them together. So I'm passing in the model into the view, and then my element. I'm just using a uh, div with an idea of bank dash view. Uh, and then when I oops, call make money, I'm going to end up with $20 signs in my model, and, uh, whoops. Hmm. So this one is not working. Well, I'm not going to debug it right in a second. Um, so, I'm going to skip over this, um, and the, no pun intended, but um, when working with functions, one of the things that gets confusing <coughs> is what this refers to, um, and just to kind of, I guess I won't skip completely over, but uh, when you have a, a name function like this, and you call it, uh, the context that the function is executed in, even though it's inside of this um, this other function, so it has this closure set up. Um, when you call this function, it's actually calling it in the context of the window. And so this actually refers to the window, not to the object instance. Um, there's a way around that, um, which is to use this bind um, property of a function. So this is something that came to came out in ECMA 5. So it's been in, it's available in most browsers. Uh, underscore, which is sort of a companion to backbone, has its own um, buying method which works in all browsers. Um, but basically this is returning a new function where the context when you call the function will have this set to this. 
which means that this dot get uh, money will be uh, referring to the object, this model, and it will actually return the value we expect instead of having common uh, being undefined. So when I run the previous example here, uh, undefined is not a function. So when they're saying undefined is not a function here, it's saying get is undefined. Um, and so get isn't a function because it's undefined um, because it's looking on, uh, on the window object. In this case, because of the log that bind this, when I call log, it works properly and is logging uh, this dot get money. Um, Okay, just a few more slides to go here. So, in terms of the background, we kind of talked about this notion of a, a view, which is which is the presentation layer, and model, which is the data layer. Um, then there's another kind of piece, and this piece is useful even with outside outside of the context of a background kind of system, which is how do you message between components in a way where in a way that's quite similar, actually, to how uh, hooks work in WordPress, where you have actions and filters. And uh, the, one of the nice things about actions and filters is that they're very forgiving. So you can say, do action, um, uh, make me a sandwich. And if nothing has added an action of make me a sandwich, it just doesn't do anything. It just kind of carries on, and there, there's, no, there's no harm or foul. So that makes it very sort of forgiving. Uh, whereas if I had a function call there, make me a, a sandwich, and nothing else, you know, I, had, I hadn't defined what make me a sandwich, I hadn't defined that function, it's going to throw a fatal error. And um, WordPress isn't going to be happy, your page is going to be maybe a white screen, depending on when, when the execution happened. So those filters, actually, they're very forgiving in that respect. Um, so. To have a system that's forgiving like that in, in the JavaScript world, we can use uh, events, um, which are natural because we use them all the time for connecting uh, our view layer to uh, UI interactions uh, that the user uh, provides, whether it's uh, key events or mouse events or uh, scroll events or touch events. Um, so this just adds, instead of doing the logging with a console.log statement, it's creating a, a custom event. This is like uh, not using any backbone. This is just standard uh, APIs within the browser. Um, I think, I'm not sure which browsers support custom <coughs> event. Um, but I think all of the most recent ones do. Um, anyway, so it's just creating a custom event called money added and then a listener that then is bound up here. And any time make money is called then, a new custom event is going to be dispatched, which then this listener will be listening to. And then we have our logging statement. Um, so that, I prefixed it with added, so we have Okay, so Backbone has its own uh, syntax for doing the same thing, uh, this, this on um, function. So I can uh, bind events to any of the, the core Backbone components. So here I've created an object instance of the Backbone model and created a namespace event. This colon is just a namespace, um, which does the same thing as the previous example does. So, anyway. So, uh, it's getting kind of late. Um, but any questions about any of that? Obviously, uh, I think that you know, there's lots of exploration that can be done. Um, and once you've explored 
some backbone and some, some of these JavaScript fundamentals. You can even go into some other areas. So uh, you can go and dig into Node.js, which is an area that I've been playing around with some. Um, we can dig into some of the more recent APIs that the browsers have added. Uh, request animation frame, which is uh, fueling a lot of these sort of new animation frameworks. Uh, uh, one that has got a lot of attention is called Famous. Famous, F-A-M-O dot U-S. Um, really slick um, experiences on the web. Um, next version of JavaScript is um, going to be based on ECMAScript 6, so um, there's a lot of discussion about how that's going to work. There's a lot of new functionality, um, and browsers are gradually going to be adopting um, aspects coming from this body. Um, if you're into graphic stuff, WebGL is interesting, Canvas. Uh, Web Workers is a way to um, do more asynchronous stuff in the browser, so uh, things like uh, computationally expensive work, doing them in a separate thread so that they don't block your UI. Um, and sort of along the lines of Web Workers, uh, there's some projects where uh, you can compile C or other languages to JavaScript, which makes it possible to take advantage of libraries written in other languages inside of JavaScript. Pretty crazy. Um, and then uh, WebSockets are also pretty interesting. So I'll leave you with this uh, test flight from SpaceX, um, which uh, is pretty amazing. If you haven't been following some of the stuff that they're doing with technology and rockets. Um, I think it's, uh, unfortunately, I didn't hook up my sound. So that looks all, that's all fine in the end. Looks like a normal rocket launcher. Not so Pretty amazing stuff. Um. <laughs> so if we're doing that with rockets, what can, what we, what can we do with the web? Uh, anyway, thanks everyone for hanging around. And, uh,